In this lecture, I wish to deal with the recovery of Western Europe, uh, its developments economically, demographically, socially, uh, from the uh, early medieval period up to the time of the Crusades. And this lecture starts a series of four lectures that are related uh, to explain why the Crusades came out of Western Europe uh, into the heartland of the Islamic world to reclaim Jerusalem. And this is an important point to stress because for both Muslims and Byzantines, these Crusades were really rather perplexing. Uh, the Byzantine Empress uh, uh, and uh, historian Anna Comenna uh, implicitly uh, writes that these Crusaders are the equivalent of a swarm of locusts. Uh, I discussed how the Seljuk Turks arrived in the Middle East, revived um, Islamic power in the traditions of both Jihad as well as Ghazi warrior, uh, and this was understandable, I mean settlement, conquest. Uh, but expe expeditions from Western Europe, which had long been a fringe area in the medieval world, uh, to reclaim these holy cities uh, with in some ways such remarkably limited objectives uh, and such great undertakings are, are really quite baffling, uh, not only to contemporaries but to us as well. And uh, that's part of the fascination of the Crusades, and that is explaining why uh, did the Western Europeans produce this uh, peculiar brand of holy war. Not that holy war was unknown in the Middle Ages, uh, but that it took the form it did. And this requires us to look at several related issues. And in this lecture, I want to stress the economic and social changes in Europe uh, leading up to the Crusades, uh, because this hits at the heart of one way that the Crusades have been often interpreted. Uh, that is, they were migrations of unwanted nobles who were conveniently exported to the benefit of monarchies at home. Uh, they were also a way of exporting um, excess population, uh, that uh, it was a form of adventure as well as a way of keeping your overcrowded populations um, under control. And as we shall see, this is, this is far from the story, uh, that in many ways the Crusades represent uh, an achievement, an achievement of over 150 years in which Western Europe had moved from really rather low level of agriculture, technology, and trade to remarkably high levels, now exceeding in many cases uh, Roman levels, uh, and therefore this economic prosperity, the social development, allowed for the launching of the Crusades. Uh, that without that type of prosperity, demographic recovery, trade, uh, the Crusades would be inconceivable. And this is an important point to stress. So what I plan to do in this lecture is to look at uh, first and foremost, uh, changes in agriculture, the key changes that allowed for this uh, revival in prosperity. Uh, because ultimately, agriculture was the base of all these early medieval economies. Uh, then we can look at some of the more sophisticated issues uh, dealing uh, with uh, uh, changes in demography, technology, and trade, which all hinged on uh, the, uh, the revival and improvement of uh, agriculture. And I believe from these changes we can get some understanding of how the Crusades were financed and equipped uh, in uh, the 11th and 12th centuries. Well, let's look at what uh, medieval agriculture must have been like. And this requires us to step back a bit from uh, what you would have seen in 1095 when Pope Urban II preached the First Crusade. Uh, European agriculture had come a far way uh, from um, its origins. Uh, the Romans had improved and developed agricultural techniques in their northwestern provinces, which would be Britain, Wales, uh, Gaul, which France, the Lowlands, Rhine, Rhineland, Germany, Italy, Spain, northern Italy, which was really in many ways not even regarded as part of Rome until quite late, uh, and uh, Roman uh, uh, methods of organization uh, were often centered around a villa, uh, which in many ways is seen as the predecessor of the classic medieval manor. Uh, most of us have images of the Lord of his manor, in his manor, ruling over his uh, demean, that is, his immediate territories, his land that produces uh, the food that sustains him and his retinues and his family. And this manor was the primary economic and social unit of medieval Europe. Uh, the manors, in some ways, were uh, evolved out of the Roman villa. Uh, we can see this very clearly uh, in the first set of extensive records we get since the fall of the Roman Empire, and those are the Carolingian inventories or capitularies. These were records kept by uh, Charlemagne, uh, who ruled from 768 to 814, and his successors, that is, the uh, great emperors of the Frankish Empire, who had reestablished political uh, unity and authority in Western Europe. 
the um, uh, important features of the manor was that, uh, at least in northwestern Europe, and there were regional differences, I must stress, and to a large extent we're going to look at northwestern Europe, which prevailed in England, in, in France, and uh, Western Germany, uh, Northern Italy was, and Central Italy were, were quite a world in their own. Uh, but at least in Northwestern Europe, uh, we see that the manor uh, was really based on the exploitation of labor in the form of peasants who were serfs. Uh, uh, families that were not free, that were under the authority of their lord, uh, and yet had certain, um, the Lord had an enormous number of seniorial rights over them, actually could handle uh, matters of justice, uh, but were not slaves. And there is a very distinct, um, uh, a very distinct classification here made in the documents. Slaves were people who were captured, usually uh, destined for foreign markets, who would be sold as, as chattels, as possessions, whereas serfs were in quite a different category. Uh, they probably evolved out of various dependent land tenures uh, from the late Roman age, particularly the so-called colony that appear in Roman legislation in the 4th and 5th century. But by the 9th century, um, they are defined in Western Europe as those owing labor services to their lord. Uh, that is, uh, they had to plow and perform all sorts of labor, that transporting of goods, harvesting uh, on the demesne, on the land owned by their lord, uh, their landlord. Uh, in addition, uh, the serfs worked their own fields in a variety of arrangements, um, uh, sometimes communally, sometimes separately, and, uh, and from their own fields, they paid rents, rents in kind. Uh, this would be uh, produce or animals or whatever. Now, this arrangement that characterized Northwestern Europe uh, in the 8th and 9th centuries, when we have these Carolingian records, uh, was at a pretty low level. Uh, in many ways, uh, the productivity of these manors were quite below uh, what you would have had of a Roman villa of the 2nd century AD. Uh, we have limited documents, uh, but archaeology has come to our assistance and has also indicated how, in some ways, uh, as one uh, famous um, uh, historian of uh, early medieval Europe, economic historian uh, Georges Duby put it, uh, the incredibly um, routine and even boring diet uh, produced by this form of agriculture uh, was uh, relieved by the prospect of starvation at regular intervals. Uh, tools were scarce. Uh, Carolingian inventories, records, uh, report iron tools as a precious commodity. Most of the tools were wood. Uh, the extent and range of crops were fairly limited. Uh, mostly grains, uh, oats, uh, barley, wheat. Uh, you had both spring, or in, uh, spring and summer, uh, uh, spring and, um, yes, uh, uh, summer grains. Uh, lentils, uh, much of your meat was still uh, acquired from hunting. Uh, and there was a tendency of lords to maintain large forest zones that were separate. Uh, these were, um, in England, later consolidated as a whole separate area under its own judicial system directly tied to the crown. Uh, but uh, meadows uh, were kept separate for pasturing of animals, forest for hunting. Um, there were restrictions on what uh, serfs could do in these forest zones. What, they could not chop down trees, but they were allowed to collect dead wood for fuel. There are a whole variety of arrangements in these manors, uh, on each manor. So that um, life was remarkably localized. The lords restricted uh, the, the activities and movements of their serfs. Uh, and nonetheless, uh, from this uh, almost elementary system, uh, Western Europe recovered. Uh, Western Europe made strides. It was a long process. Uh, it was a process that probably stretched out over 400 years, although in the last 150 years before the Crusades, the pace of change had picked up significantly. Now, the reason that pace of change had picked up significantly in the 10th and 11th century were, uh, were a number. Uh, there are political, wider political considerations, uh, military considerations we'll discuss in later lectures. Uh, but strictly on the ground, quite literally, uh, in terms of the people who are doing the bulk of the uh, food producing, these, these peasants, these serfs, uh, the changes uh, took uh, several different forms. One was simply making more available iron tools. Uh, 
uh, from the 9th and 10th century, there was uh, improvements in iron technology and the dissemination of more tools. And lords had an incentive to do this. Each landlord wanted to maximize the amount of revenues out of his, his serfs, and so did so. Uh, in addition, there were changes, for instance, in organization. Uh, one of the most notable one is that the uh, Northwestern Europeans uh, became quite expert in um, breeding their crops and their livestock uh, uh, to get a maximum effect out of it. They, they, they um, domesticated better grains, but they also shifted to better organization, better management. Uh, the classic uh, example of this is what is known as the shift from a two-field to a three-field system. And this was an important shift that occurred in Europe in the 10th and 11th centuries, and in some parts of Europe even later, uh, and it wasn't uh, uh, employed uh, across Europe everywhere. There were large areas of Europe that retained a two-field system in uh, areas such as in Ireland and parts of Scandinavia where you even had simpler levels of organization where you had hamlets and pastoralists operating. But essentially what happened is you uh, put three, it's, well let's take an example. I think that's the best way to, ex to ex explain it. Let us take a village in the year 1000 in France or in the Midlands in England and that particular village is a series of serfs, families of serfs, owing um, uh, crops uh, as their labor, uh, as their uh, rents uh, to the Lord. Uh, under a two-field system, uh, a, um, a total acreage of 1,200 uh, would be sowed, uh, 1,200 would be plowed, half of it would be uh, sowed with spring uh, grain, half of it with the fall or late summer. So you would have 600 acres under um, spring, 600 acres under fall grains, and then 1,200 acres fallow. Now that would require you to plow 1,200 twice. That is 1,200 to get the land plowed to sow, and 1,200 to plow after you harvest, to plow everything back under. You would also plow your fallow at least once. That would allow the animals to move around, uh, uh, leave their droppings, and then you could plow it in and fertilize the soil, which meant in the course of a year, you um, had uh, 1,200 acres under cultivation, and you uh, did a total of uh, 3,600 acres of plowing. If you shifted to a three-field system, you would have 800 uh, sown with spring grain, 800 with winter grain, um, and then you would leave 800 uh, fallow. And if you do the math, it's quite simple. You end up doing only 3,200 uh, acres of plowing, and you have 400 more acres under cultivation. That is, you've uh, increased your um, acreage by one-third, uh, you've reduced your labor by one-ninth. Now these types of techniques, and they could be, uh, uh, could be uh, augmented by weeding, by uh, improved um, varieties of grains, meant that in the 10th and 11th century, by best guess, food production was going up at least by 50 percent. And once again, given the very localized nature of European society, landlords had an incentive to do so. They pressed these arrangements. They shifted over uh, to the three-field system. This was assisted by the, uh, the adoption of what are known as coulter plows. These are plows that are able to cut and turn over the soil, the dense, rich soils of northern Europe. Uh, they also adapted a horse collar, a collar uh, which allowed a horse to pull a plow. This was not a device available in antiquity where all plowing was done by oxen. Horses could plow much faster. Uh, and you see a variety of changes. That is, uh, not only could you work faster, you could put more land on cultivation, you could actually reduce your acreage with the new management system. And the result is uh, that villages expanded, and furthermore, um, uh, you had peasants very often consolidating into larger units of villages or town and walking out to their, uh, to their farms. Uh, that is, uh, population densities could start forming. Uh, you didn't have to be so scattered because now you were using horses, you had improved plows, uh, you had a whole new system of management, and that had an important um, uh, point in European society because with this uh, you began to get something of a town and village life associated with fairs and markets. Uh, that was not the case, uh, say, in the 6th, 7th, and 8th century. Uh, 
Uh, other improvements included mills, windmills in northern Europe. Uh, Europeans became extremely good at clearing forests in the 9th and 11th century. We begin to get uh, the process of known as a sarting, that is clearing out wastelands, bringing it under cultivation. Again, landlords often gave their tenants uh, generous terms to do so. So that by the year 1095, when the first crusade has been uh, preached, uh, the economic recovery of Europe has been substantial. Uh, in food production, uh, the congregation of populations into villages and towns across the heartland of Western Europe uh, was one of the most important features in, in European society. Now, these changes in food production also uh, were accompanied by other uh, changes and also related and influenced these other changes. Uh, these included uh, the simple fact that the demography of Western Europe uh, uh, recovered and the agricultural improvements allowed this. Uh, the end of the Roman world, uh, really in the 6th century AD, there was the first of what um, are thought to be plagues that led to a demographic collapse. Uh, this is a plague that's reported in Byzantine uh, sources and then later in Western sources from 542 to 543. And then there's a series of other plagues. These are cycles. They're known as pandemics which ravaged the population and led to a demographic collapse. That is, so many people were killed. In some instances, this plague would wipe out half the population in a matter of months that you couldn't reproduce fast enough and population contracted. And in the early Middle Ages, there had been a steady contra contraction of population, probably from the mid-6th century running into the early 8th century. And uh, for numbers in Western Europe, um, this is speculative, but at least they give you some sense. Uh, the island of Britain, for instance, uh, England and Wales, uh, in the Roman age was one million. Uh, by 750, it may have been halved. Uh, the same is true in Gaul, uh, which would have been halved from six to three million and you can multiply examples. Uh, actually, Germany and Central Europe fared pretty well because that was fairly underpopulated at the time these plagues hit. But it was clear that it had been a major drop. Uh, in addition, the political breakup of the Roman Empire had led to the disruption of trade routes, town life on the Rhineland and in Italy. Uh, in the 8th century, there was significant uh, loss of uh, of populations by city in Italy. It's cities in Italy. This can be documented archaeologically. Uh, uh, in some parts of southern and central Italy, as, as many as 75% 75, 75 of urban centers or town centers were abandoned at one point. So that this uh, demographic collapse, which was related to the, uh, the impact of these pandemics, uh, this uh, was restored uh, by the success of European uh, uh, agriculture and starting probably at the opening of the 10th century as these new methods were adopted the new technologies come in European po population begins to rise and by 1000 European populations had probably attained or exceeded late Roman levels not only was it important to stress that European populations were on the rise these people were being fed it wasn't as if you had n enormous population uh, that uh, was, you know, starving. This is not to say that the population was not susceptible to disease, that its diet is very restricted and even horrendous by our notions of what is a nutritious diet. But nonetheless, that population had hit Roman levels and in some instances uh, was getting us to the level of a, of a population on par with parts of the Byzantine and Islamic world, especially in such areas as Italy. Uh, they, these changes, these changes in demographics and agriculture uh, also had other major economic re, uh, repercussions. And that uh, led to a far more diversified economy uh, than when we started out in the early Middle Ages. Uh, a number of associated activities with food production, such as mining, timber, um, and uh, textiles, uh, often done by the so-called putting out system. All of these rose in the 10th and 11th century in, in, in great amounts. Uh, and uh, th uh, this uh, spawned a revival of regional trade, which eventually tied into the wider international trade that we see uh, connecting Western Europe to the Mediterranean ports and then to the Near East and uh, the Byzantine Empire. This was assisted in a variety of ways, um, trade in these goods. Uh, one was the improvements in shipbuilding, uh, which is pretty obvious. Uh, uh, the uh, 7th and 8th centuries saw a shift in uh, building of ships in the Mediterranean world from what is known as a shell system, 
of construction. This was used by the Romans where you essentially make a very fine piece of furniture. You fit the wood very carefully together. It's all uh, you don't even have to caulk it. It's, it's so well done. Uh, the advantages of it is that the ship lasts for 100 years or more. Uh, it's extremely labor intensive. You need an enormous amount of metal to construct it. Or uh, the, the shift went from that um, uh, form of construction to what is often called the skeleton construction, uh, which is a type of construction pioneered in northern uh, Europe. Uh, it's perhaps associated with the Celtic peoples of the British Isles, uh, most famously. And that is essentially putting down the ribs uh, of your ship, the, uh, the keel and ribs, and then slapping the rest of it on there as boards and caulking it. Uh, this is far less expensive and labor intensive. And this shift from a a um, shell to a skeleton construction uh, was achieved uh, in the 7th and 8th century and allowed for some very important um, innovations in technology. Uh, there were improved sails uh, and improved oars. Uh, we find by the early 8th and uh, 9th centuries, especially Scandinavians making important breakthroughs in uh, keels and frames of ships and producing two important um, uh, vessels, the so-called long ships, which sustained the Viking raids, the warship, and the Canar, the great uh, cargo ship of northern Europe that could withstand the storms of the North Atlantic and became a primary ship uh, of the North Atlantic for early medieval commerce. So uh, what is even more important to stress in, in, in uh, European technology is that the shipbuilding techniques in northern Europe were readily transmi uh, transmitted to the Mediterranean shores of Latin Christendom, the ports of Italy, the ports of southern France and Spain. And so there was a constant exchange of shipbuilding techniques in the 150 years before the Crusades that produced the impressive galleys of, and, uh, and the cargo vessels that transported the Crusaders to the Levant. These uh, uh, changes in shipbuilding was also accompanied by the revival and use of coined money, something that had largely fallen out of use in daily um, markets, uh, weekly markets, monthly markets. Uh, coinage, uh, even in the ninth century, was essentially a single silver denomination, the so-called denier of, of uh, Charlemagne. Uh, we would call it a penny in English, a fenic in German, denaro in Italian, it's all the same denomination. It might weigh anywhere from, I don't know, 1.5 grams to 2.25 grams. And it was the only denomination issued, used primarily for judicial fines, for settling up rents. And uh, these coins actually became debased. That is, they kept mixing more copper in them uh, in the period after Charlemagne's death. They're often referred to uh, in the, uh, the, the um, uh, uh, rents as the black money because very little silver was left. Well, there were important surges in minting of silver, and this was connected with improved mining techniques in the 9th century at Mel, uh, in the 10th century at Goslar in Germany. Uh, there were surges in coinage of more silver money. Uh, in Italy, where uh, the use of money had never really disappeared, town life had uh, certainly remained in the Byzantine areas, you had uh, monetized markets. And uh, by the year 1000, uh, this type of monetized markets had come to characterize not only the Italian cities, but a line of trade routes running up um, across the Alps and uh, down the Rhine uh, to the North Sea. And this becomes one primary axis. The other is to go up the Rhone, uh, the Seon, and the rivers of France to the Channel uh, uh, to southern England. And along these axes of trade routes, uh, the flow of goods, the flow of money increased uh, with improved shipbuilding. So in 1095, uh, the trade routes of, of, of Western Europe now linked these areas, which certainly at the time of the uh, beginning of the Abbasid Caliphate must have looked about as remote as could be, to the wider, quote unquote, civilized world of the Caliphate and Byzantium. The Italian cities were particularly important in these links. These would include the cities of Genoa and Venice, uh, the South Italian ports such as Amalfi, which were, were important uh, entrepots uh, uh, between uh, Western and Central and Northern Europe and points east. The variety and numbers of goods increased as well. And uh, by 1095, Europeans had become uh, quite accustomed to importing finer silks,
weapons, utensils, relics, ivories, a whole variety of goods produced in the Byzantine world and the Islamic world. And in return, they now had the coined money, they had the resources, the prosperity to purchase these goods. So in many ways, uh, the Crusades were only possible uh, because of these changes in trade, improved shipbuilding, the return of the use of coined money by 1095, uh, which, was, which was a key element in priming and diversifying uh, the rebirth of the Western economy. The, um, the trade routes themselves uh, uh, were significant. That is the directions in which trade went. Uh, by 1095, Italians had become extremely well versed in uh, the trade routes of the Mediterranean. And this is a point that I must stress. The Byzantine fleet and its uh, commercial vessels still were the dominant naval, Christian naval power in Western Europe. Uh, but trade routes and climate favored not only the Byzantines but the Western Europeans. If you look at the Mediterranean world, it is always easier to sail east and down than it is to sail west and up. That is, if you start in Barcelona, Marseille, Genoa, or Venice, it's far easier to sail to Egypt, to the Levant, than in the other direction. And that is because of the prevailing winds and currents. So the Western European cities on the Mediterranean, the Christian cities there, were in a very uh, desirable place and extremely strategic place for uh, launching the Crusades. In addition, Western Europe had the hardwoods, the timber, the pitch, and the resources necessary to build the increasingly complicated and sophisticated ships that were being launched in the Mediterranean. Uh, whereas the Muslims always found themselves at a disadvantage uh, because the Western Europeans uh, had the, the naval stores, the trained personnel, uh, and the advantages of wind and sail. And so by 1095, uh, much of the carrying trade, uh, at least in the Western Mediterranean, had fallen into the hands of Italians, Provencals, that is the people of southern France, uh, in Barcelona. Up the Rhine, uh, that is through the, uh, uh, the river system that would lead into Holland and the Low Countries and then across the North and, and Baltic Seas. In these regions, uh, trade fell primarily in the hands of Frisians in the 8th and 9th century, later Scandinavians, and finally Germans. Uh, and by 1095, uh, the German skippers, uh, English skippers, had perfected the sailing ships uh, necessary to move large numbers of crusaders around the uh, difficult shores of the Atlantic through the uh, Straits of Gibraltar, uh, which I think they're still calling the Pillars of Hercules, uh, uh, and into the Mediterranean. And so uh, by, uh, by all standards, this is an extraordinary ability to move people and goods, uh, which no one else has. I mean, there was no chance of a Muslim army being transported uh, from North Africa to England, assuming the uh, the rule, the Muslim rule, would even want to go to England, but uh, nonetheless, the um, uh, the ability of the Western Europeans to move these forces is directly tied to the technological and economic breakthroughs. The First Crusade would further this. That is, the Crusades came at a point in which the economic development of Western Europe was rising, and the First Crusade and subsequent Crusades would augment and accelerate these changes. The Crusades themselves did not bring it about, but these economic and social changes did make the Crusades possible. And just think for a moment, that is an extraordinary uh, uh, point to stress, because when the First Crusade moves off, by all accounts, at least 100,000 Western Europeans marched off to the Holy Land in 1096 and 1097. Uh, most of them took overland routes, but they were also sustained uh, by uh, supply ships, uh, by the fleets of Pisa and Genoa, by the Byzantine fleet at one point, uh, to get them uh, to that location. And this was the first major military expedition launched from Western Europe since the Roman Age. Nothing like this had been attempted in, well, well over 600, 700 years. Uh, and this was only possible by the remarkable economic and social change in Western Europe over the last 150 years. And most of that economic and social change ultimately rested on the backs of those peasants um, who made the improvements and made the changes uh, that transformed the European economy.